Okay, so this is where we left off last time, is where we were studying amenable groups. And uh, we already saw a few characteriz or yeah, a few characterizations of amenability. Uh, one useful one being they satisfy Kakutani's fixed point theorem, uh, meaning that if you have a non-empty compact convex subset of a topoly a locally convex topological vector space, and if the group acts by affine homeomorphisms, then there's a fixed point. And then we saw that it was also equivalent to every action on a compact house door space has an invariant measure. And today we're going to prove a few other characterizations uh, and that I've written here, mainly that a group is amenable if and only if there exists a sequence or net, uh, I should say, of probability measures uh, such that they become almost invariant as n tends to infinity. Uh, another is that the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors, which means the same thing here, except that they're in norm two and these are unit vectors. And then the last that there exists a Fulner net. Um, so uh, some of these implications we've already done. So let me remind you of that. So here's starting the proof. So we already showed that four implies two. Uh, maybe we didn't ex write it out explicitly, but in our proof that abelian groups are amenable, we did it implicitly. Specifically, if we have, if Fn is a Fulner net, so then we can define mu n to just be the uh, uniform probability measure on these sets. So this is just one over the size of the set and then times the characteristic function of these sets. So that is the uniform probability measure on these sets. And then you can just check that in this case, we have mu n minus T mu n, if we take the push forward measure of this, look at it in the uh, probability norm, which is just the L1 norm, then we compute this explicitly as, and we did this computation for the abelian groups, this is one over Fn, and then the difference is either you have uh, elements in Fn which are not in the translate, or you have things in the translates which are not in that thing, so it's exactly the symmetric difference of Fn with Tn. Um, so from a Fulner net, we exactly get a almost invariant sequence of or net of probability measures. Uh, and then we also saw that two implies one. This was also something that we've already done because we can identify the space of probability measures on gamma. Uh, so this is a subset of L1 uh, of positive functions which sum to one and we can identify them with, so this is inside of L1, which we know is the free dual of L infinity. So in particular, we can interpret these functions, this is just integration, that a probability measure on gamma gives you a linear functional on L infinity of gamma. And the nice, and it gives you a state. And the state space of L infinity function is compact in the weak star topology. So any cluster point, any accumulation point, of the sequence mu n in the state space of L infinity uh, will be an invariant. So that's how you go from condition two to getting a mean. Uh, and then we also have that uh, condition two and condition three are pretty easy to see that they're equivalent to each other. Um, and that's because if, if you have any mu say in L1 of gamma, um, 
then you can create an L2 function uh, quite easily by taking, say this is a positive function, then you can create an L2 function by taking the square root. So then we can consider uh, C, which is going to be an L2 function. And this is given by C of T is just the square root of E of T. And if it's a probability measure, meaning it sums to one, then this will be a unit vector in L2. And then finally, you just need to check that if you look at C minus the left regular representation multiplied by C, take the norm two of this. Well, this is just, I'll write it out explicitly. Uh, the norm two squared is just going to be um, the sum over t or s and gamma of c s uh, well let me write in c so this will be square root of mu s minus square root of mu g inverse s uh, and then absolute value and now you can just use an inequality for uh, just positive real numbers, which is that if you have A minus B, then the absolute value, I guess, should be uh, less than or equal to something involving their square. A minus B all squared, and maybe there should be a two somewhere. I always forget these things. Uh, a, oh, sorry, A and B are squared. I think something like, uh, A squared, sum this, this is less than, Mm, what am I doing wrong? There should be a square here. And then probably a two there. I think that's what it is. So you can verify that. There's just some inequality you have for positive numbers. Uh, I think so. Maybe there's not even a two. Eh, probably one or the other. And then from this, you get that if the right hand side is small, then the left hand side will also be small. And the right hand side is uh, small because, of course, so this is going to be less than or equal to something like two, some in S and gamma. And now you have mu of S minus mu to the inverse of S. So value. And then this is exactly just twice mu minus t mu one. And conversely, if you have an L2 function, which is a unit, an L2 vector, which is a unit vector, then you can go back to a probability measure. So if you have C and L2, then consider mu in probability measure on gamma. And this is just by mu of s is equal to c of s absolute value squared. And this is a unit vector. So if you have a unit vector, then you get a probability measure from this by just squaring things. And then again, you look at what is this mu minus t mu in L1. So this is just the sum over S and gamma. Now you have absolute value mu of S minus mu to the inverse S. And now you use some other inequality uh, that this should be less than or equal to sum S and gamma. And now we want to get uh, so mu of s is the square of something. So this is going to, we want to replace this with c of s uh, minus 
C of T inverse S absolute value squared. And probably maybe there's a two there. One of these, there's a two. The other one, there's not a two. I forget which one it is. Uh, but these are just inequalities on real numbers that you can just verify. And so then you see that this is less than or equal to something involving this. Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I think that looks good. Uh, so this is less than or equal to the two norm. So this is how you can go back and forth between an almost invariant probability measure and an almost invariant vector. So the last thing we have to do is show how you get from an amenable group to a Fulner sequence or a Fulner net. So we're going to break that into two pieces. We're going to go first from one to two and then from two to four. That's how we're going to go back. So now uh, proof. So here we have one implies two. And this has a name. This is known as Day's trick. Where the argument I'm going to give here was uh, discovered by Day. Um, so the, the theorem that amenability gives you a Fulner sequence, this is Tarski's theorem, but the proof I'm going to go through uh, is these two steps. And the first step is the proof is due to Day. And the second step, the proof is due to Namioka. So here's day trick, day's trick. So we start with the fact that, uh, let's suppose gamma has a left, or L infinity of gamma has a left invariant state. And let's uh, fix say T1 up through Tn and gamma. So then I want to find a finite subset of gamma, which is almost invariant with respect, or sorry, I want to find a probability measure on gamma, which is almost invariant with respect to uh, these Ti's. So that's what the goal will be. And to do that, I'm going to consider the set let me give it a name, uh, script C. And this is going to be the set of all uh, ordered pairs where it's going to be mu minus T1 of mu, mu minus T2 of mu, etc. mu minus Tn of mu. And this is going to be uh, in, I guess, L1 of gamma n copies, so direct sum n times. That's where this is going to live, and this is, uh, so it's a set of all things such that mu is a probability measure. Probability measures which I'm identifying with states on L infinity. Uh, so what do we notice about this uh, script set C is, so note, that so C, is convex. So that's the first thing to notice about this C. Uh, the other thing to notice about this C is that by Goldstein's theorem, uh, so L1 is the pre-dual of, of L infinity. So probability measures are just states coming from the pre-dual. But of course, by Goldstein's theorem, He showed that for any Banach space, it embeds in a weak star dense way and it's, and it's double dual. So we have that L1 of gamma embedding into L infinity of gamma dual. So that's the double dual of L1 is weak star dense. And it's also uh, not difficult to see that the space, uh, the state space, states coming from L1 are weak star dense in the state space coming from over here. I'll leave that to you guys as an exercise. Uh, actually, so Goldstein proved, sorry, it's not just this, but it's the uniball 
is weak star density uniball. Uh, and then states are exactly linear functionals that are in the uniball and they take value one at one, right? This is a standard lemma from functional analysis that a state, uh, a linear functional is a state if and only if it is, um, has norm one and it's equal to one at the identity. So from the fact that the uniball is weak star dense, and you can also check that things which are give one to one, well, therefore they will also be dense and things given one to one. And from this, you conclude that the states coming from L1, mainly the probability measures, is weak star dense in the state space here. So we get that therefore the probability measures for gamma uh, is weak star dense in the state space of L infinity again. So what does this mean? This means that if we take the weak star closure of the set C, then we get all possible things by replacing mu of probability measure with any state. But by hypothesis, there's a left invariant state. And when we plug in this left invariant state to this formula right here, uh, then we just get the sequence of zeros. So therefore, what do we get is we get that zero is in the weak star closure of C when we th think of this as in the dual space. Um, but what do we know there? Well, the weak star topology restricted to L1 is exactly the weak topology. So we get that therefore zero is in the weak closure when we think of this as an L1. But now Hanbonic separation theorem says that if you have a, uh, con a convex set, then the weak closure is the same as the norm closure. So by Hanbonic, zero is now in the norm closure, and this is the norm closure in L1. So that's the Hanbonic separation theorem. Uh, if zero wasn't in the norm closure, then there would be a linear, a continuous linear functional which separated zero from the set, but then it wouldn't be in the weak closure. Uh, so what does that mean? That means in particular, so therefore, if epsilon is greater than zero, there exists some mu, a probability measure on gamma, such that the norm in this, so this is say L1 direct sum of this, so such that the sum as I goes from one to N of mu minus Ti mu and one is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we want to show. All right, so that's Day's trick. Uh, any questions about Day's trick? I have a quick question, just, just yeah. to be sure. On that step where you say zero is in the weak star closure of C, and then series in the weak closure. You're just using that the... I'm just using that the weak topology on L1 is weak the star. same as the weak star topology when you view L1 as sitting inside of L infinity of dual. Yeah, okay, okay. They both come from taking the duality with L infinity. And that Goldstein theorem is that... Goldstein's theorem just says that the uh, in any Bonnach space, the uniball is weak star dense in its double dual, and the uniball the double dual. If you Google Goldstein's theorem, you should find it pretty quickly. Okay. It, there's there are e easy proofs of it. These that's an easy result. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, and from Goldstein's theorem, you immediately get as a consequence. I, I outlined the argument that in in any um, von Neumann algebra, mainly L infinity of gamma, the normal states are dense in the state space. Uh, 
we start in some state space, which is what I used here. The probability measure, these are the normal states and their weak star dense in the state space. And it's exactly the argument I told you. By Goldstein's theorem, I, I mean, it really is just Goldstein's theorem. States are just uh, linear functionals with norm one and take one at the identity. All right, so that was day's trick. So now we want to go from almost invariant probability measures to existence of a Fulner net. And for this, we're going to do a proof. So this is called an Amyoka trick. Uh, Namyoka's trick uh, is maybe a bit more straightforward, but uh, I don't know, maybe you have to think about it a bit more before it sinks in. Uh, so what is Nam Namyoka's trick? So uh, Again, we have, uh, we fix T1 through Tn in gamma and epsilon greater than zero. And we want to produce a set, a finite subset, which is almost invariant with respect to these Ti's. And what do we know? We know from condition two that there exists a probability measure, which is almost invariant. So let's take mu a probability measure such that uh, say the sum of mu minus ti mu uh, in norm one is less than epsilon. So what is Nam Yoka's trick? Nam Yoka's trick is to write the left and right side of this inequality uh, in a clever way by integrating over characteristic functions. So specifically, we let, uh, you know, for each, for each R say greater than zero, we let the characteristic function from zero to R. So this is, uh, let this be the characteristic function. Uh, on the interval. Zero R, so on this unit interval. And then the thing to notice here is that for any two positive numbers. So then if we have, say, alpha and beta positive numbers, then we can have a formula for the difference between them, namely alpha minus beta in absolute value. We can write this as an integral. This is the integral of, and now we take the characteristic function between zero and R, apply it to alpha, subtract the characteristic function between zero and R, apply it to beta, take absolute value, and then integrate with respect to R. So from zero to infinity, say. Uh, why is this formula, why does this formula hold? Uh, this is because think about what happens on the right here. Either alpha and beta are both greater than R, in which case you've written zero minus zero, or if alpha and beta are both less than R, then you've written one minus one, which is zero, or um, R is strictly between alpha and beta, in which case you have one minus zero, which is one, or you have zero minus one, which is one. So this integral that we've written here is just the integral of the constant one function over the, over the, the interval from alpha to beta, or beta to alpha, beta is minus one. So it's just the length of the interval from alpha to beta, which is just the absolute value of the difference. All right, so I haven't written anything difficult here. But now what we can do is we can apply this formula and we apply it to this uh, inequality that we have up here. Um, so notice on the right, this is a probability measure. So I could have put the norm of mu, the norm one of mu next to the epsilon. And now what we can do is we can write that out. So we get therefore, if we look at the sum as i goes from one to n, 
And now we're going to sum over elements of the group S in the group gamma. And now here I have the difference. I want to take the difference of mu of S minus mu of Ti inverse S. So I apply this formula and put the integral from zero to infinity, absolute value one zero R. And now I have mu of S minus one zero R. Now I have mu of Ti inverse S. And now we have uh, dr. And this is less than epsilon. And now here I'm going to again uh, write this out. So sum s and gamma. And now we have, um, uh, so now I'm going to take just the difference between mu of s and 0. So I'll just let one of these be 0. So I'll get the integral from 0 to infinity of the characteristic function from 0 to r of mu of s and dr. All right, sorry that's a little crammed there. Let me copy this over on the next page so that you can see it. All right, so this is the formula we have. Uh, so we have an integral. So now, of course, we can exchange. These are, we're taking absolute values here. So we're integrating positive numbers and we have sums. So we can use Fubini to pull the integral out. And now we have an integral of two positive things. And the one on the left is strictly less than the one on the right. So therefore, we know at least for some point r, this inequality has to hold. So we know that therefore there exists, oh, I see I already, uh, uh, yeah, I made a mistake. How am I gonna fix this? Uh, I chose the wrong characteristic function. So hold on, let me go back here. I'm gonna have to change this. I'm gonna have to go, I don't wanna go from zero to R, I wanna go from R to infinity because I only wanna get the part that's strictly greater than R. So everything I've said holds just as well, but I want to go from R to infinity. Sorry about that. Um, this equality holds exactly the same way. Either they're both above R, they're both below R, or they're between, in which case we get this. And all of these is R. Uh, hold on, this part now doesn't look so good. Um, Uh, wait a minute, now I'm unhappy with this. Because one should be the integral Oh, no, 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 it's fine, sorry. I was confusing myself. That's right. So this will be one as long as r is less than mu of s, and it'll be zero as soon as r is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to mu of s. So it's exactly going to get mu of s. It's exactly what I want. Okay. Sorry about that change in notation. So this is r to infinity, r to infinity, r to infinity. Much better. Uh, so we have this, in, this strict inequality 
uh, on the integral, so therefore it has to hold at some point. So therefore there exists r greater than zero such that the sum over i equals one to n of the sum over s and gamma of this characteristic function uh, absolute i one infinity with s nu to i inverse s strictly less than epsilon times the sum s and gamma all zero to infinity one infinity new s but now what have we actually written here well if you've noticed what we've written here this is just the size uh you know r is fixed here so this we're just counting one i'm oh, sorry i didn't put there shouldn't be an integral there so we're just counting one whenever mu of s is greater than r and we're counting zero everywhere else so this is just the size of the set where mu is greater than r so that's why i want r to infinity so i get a finite set here so this is uh, some finite set and what is this well again this is just one if mu is greater than r so and what is this here and this is one if ti inverse of s at mu is greater than r so in other words this is just if f is equal to the set of all s and gamma such that mu of s is greater than r so what do we have then this is finite then f is finite and what we've written on the left here is just the sum as i goes from one to n and then we've sum over all s so that's exactly just the symmetric difference here so now we have the size of f symmetric difference tif there might be an inverse there or not i can't remember you have to check and this is strictly less than epsilon and what we've written on the right is just the cardinality of s so that's exactly our fulner set right there does this make sense okay so that's namioka's trick which is a very, somehow it, it uses nothing, it's just completely elementary calculus, uh, but somehow it uh, proves something which seems like it's very strong. Um, okay, so that is showing the equivalences of uh, those notions. Um, now let me see, what did I want to talk about next? uh talked about that okay so i think uh, this was about all i wanted to say on amenable groups and i think what i would like to go on to next is kind of the extreme opposite of amenable groups uh, and talk about property t and we'll only spend uh, a few lectures uh, talking about property t as well so uh, property C is a very useful property. It has many, many applications. Uh, so it's, it's a very nice thing to have. Uh, let's see, before I do that, maybe there's one thing I want to prove about it. One more thing I want to prove about amenable groups. Uh, yes, I think the other thing I want to prove about amenable groups is the following so we'll do a little bit of c star algebra here i want to use this fact later on so if gamma is a group so then the reduced group c star algebra is the c star algebra 
generated by the left regular representation. left regular representation, which just extends multiplication. Uh, so that's the definition of the reduced group C-star algebra. There's another C-star algebra coming from the group, which is very useful to have. So that's the full group C-star algebra. The full group C-star algebra is, uh, well, one convenient way to define it, it's the C star algebra generated by the universal representation. What am I doing? Uh, say pi u, which is just going to be the direct sum of all representations pi. Uh, so you might complain about this, uh, you know, the set of all representations is not a set, and I shouldn't say this, but what I mean by that is uh, you look at all, say, representations on some Hilbert space of appropriately large cardinality. Uh, so maybe all representations on a Hilbert space L2 of gamma. So this gives you enough so that any representation you can get the norm of, of anything from the group algebra. Um, and maybe I shouldn't say the universal representation, but maybe a universal representation, but I'm not going to worry about these sorts of set theoretic problems. Uh, so this is a universal representation, uh, and you get the C-star algebra generated by this. And you can imagine by having some sort of universal representation, it has a universal property, and that's maybe the better way to think about the C-star algebra. Uh, we have the universal property that, well, one, the group uh, embeds into the universal C star algebra uh, in the unitary group. And we have the universal property that if, that if pi mapping gamma to U of H is any unitary representation, So then there is a unique star homomorphism, which I'll maybe again denote by pi from the full group C star algebra into V of H uh, extending this representation. So this is the universal property of uh, the full group C star algebra. Uh, we know that the group embeds into the unitary group of the full group C star algebra because of course the left regular representation is already contained in here somewhere. And so we have, um, so we have that it's, you know, uh, at least there's one representation where the group already embeds. So we know that the group embeds inside the unitary group of the full group C star algebra and it satisfies this property that this universal property. In particular, for the rest, left regular representation itself, we have this property. So we have this natural map from the uh, full group to the C star algebra to the reduced group C star algebra. We always have this star homomorphism here. And, uh, and one characterization of amenability is that this is an isomorphism. So maybe that's the next theorem that I want to do. Uh, let me think, have we done enough preliminaries for this?
So one problem is that um, when I prepare my notes for the class, I use my iPad to write my notes on, which is very convenient because then I have my notes stored. But, uh, but then if I forget to print them before class, then that means I don't have access to them because I'm also using my iPad to, to uh, use this as a chalkboard. So I have to remember when I prepared for this lecture yesterday, I have to remember how I did the proof. So if you have another computer, you can open the notes in your computer, right? No, it's on my iPad, not on my computer. But it, can you pass the notes to the, your computer? Oh, yes, but you guys, I'm sharing my, my screen. Uh, I mean, I could do that. I have a printer. I, I should just print my notes, which is what I, what I did on Monday and Wednesday, but I forgot to print it before class today. So, um, because I went late with my last class on accident. Uh, but it's okay. I can remember, I can remember the proof here in just a moment. Uh, so there's, of course, two directions to prove. Uh, okay, I, I know, you know, all right. So let's, let's prove this. So the theorem, is that gamma is amenable if and only if the star homomorphism from the full group C star algebra to the reduced group C star algebra uh, is a star isomorphism. So meaning it has trivial kernel. So I'll buy myself a little bit of time by proving uh, one, one direction first, that is I'll prove that this condition implies amenability. So how are we going to do that? Uh, we're going to use the fact that the universal representation, so there's another representation, which you know is very connected. So we have the left regular representation and amenability says the left regular representation uh, weakly contains the trivial representation that just says the left regular representation has almost no vectors. Uh, and the trivial representation is, gives a representation of the full group C star algebra. So what do we have? We have that if these C star algebras are, are isomorphic, so you get that then the C star reduced C star algebra of gamma has a one dimensional representation. One dimensional. Uh, star representation. non-trivial. So it takes one to one. Uh, so let's give that a name. Let's call that pi. All right. So what can we do with this pi? So this is a one-dimensional representation. So in particular, it takes positive things to positive things. All representations do. So I can also think of this as a state. And this is a state on the reduced group C star algebra, which sits inside, so the reduced, reduced group C star algebra sits inside of bounded operators on L2 of gamma. So I have a C star algebra here sitting inside of B of L2, and I have a state on the C star algebra. So by the Han Banach theorem, I can extend this to a state of the larger C star algebra. So, uh, by the Han Banach theorem, there exists a state P on bounded operators with L2 of gamma such that P of uh, lambda gamma is exactly equal to pi. So we can take the star homomorphism, this one dimensional star representation, and we can extend it to a state on V of L2. 
Uh, well, how does this help us? Well, we also have another natural C star algebra, which sits inside of B of L2, and that is the L infinity space, this von Neumann algebra, can be thought of if we think of B of L2 as matrices with gamma entries, then the L infinity space are like diagonal matrices, right? So we also have that L infinity of gamma embeds naturally inside of boundary operators of L2. Uh, to be explicit, let me maybe give this embedding a name. Let me call it M. And this is uh, by, so this is star homomorphism. And this is by M of some function F. I need to tell you what it does at some uh, function C. Let me just tell you what it does at the Dirac functions. And this is just going to be multiplication, F of T delta T. Uh, so these are just diagonal operators we can think of these as. Uh, so, or I use M for multiplication. This is just multiple, point-wise multiplication. Uh, so what's nice about this is that there's a relationship between this representation of the left regular representation and this representation of L infinity. So specifically, we have that if we take uh, the left representation of T, multiplication by F, and then lambda T star, then you can compute that this is exactly multiplication by, and then you take the T translate of F. So we have also encoded inside of B of L2, we have encoded the left action of gamma on L infinity um, by a conjugation with the left regular representation, right? Why is this? This is since we can verify this, lambda t, mf lambda t star, maybe I forgot an inverse somewhere, we'll find out, delta s, let's just compute this. So this is lambda t mf uh, delta T inverse S, which is lambda T F at T inverse S, delta T inverse S. F is just a scalar, so it commutes with the lambda T, and this is just F at T inverse S, delta S, which is multiplication by T times F times delta S. Right, so we indeed get that these two operators are equal to each other. All right, so how does this help us? Well, I claim that this phi, uh, this is a state on B of L2, we can now restrict it to L infinity, and I claim that this is an invariant mean. Uh, so let's just check that. Uh, phi of multiplication by T times F. So it's clearly a state when we compose it with M, so we get a state on L infinity, and we just need to check that it's left, um, uh, left invariant. So this is uh, phi of lambda t multiplication by f lambda t star. But now phi restricted to lambda is a uh, phi restricted to the left regular representation. This is a star homomorphism. and then this implies, since phi is a state, this implies that it's a star homomorphism, even if you plug in other operators here. This is, um, if you like, it's in the multiplicative domain of this state. So this means that this, because phi is a star homomorphism on lambda t, this is exactly equal to pi of lambda t uh, phi of mf, and then pi of lambda t star. But now these are all scalars, so everything here commutes, and you have lambda t, lambda t inverse, and so you just get v of so, uh, so this is how you show that this state that you got on L infinity is an invariant. Uh, now to go the other way of going from if gamma's amenable, then you get this star isomorphism. 
so for this, we're going to use Fell's absorption lemma. So let me type in here. Here's Fell's. Uh, which just says that if this is another way to interact with an arbitrary representation and the left regular representation. So if pi mapping gamma to u of h is a unitary representation. So then uh, pi tensor lambda is unitarily equivalent to one tensor lambda, where lambda is the left regular representation. Lambda. So if you tensor any representation with the left regular representation, it's equivalent to just a multiple of the left regular representation, right? And we're going to prove this by, by giving an explicit unit. Unitary. So let's go ahead and prove this. So the proof. So uh, we are going to define this Fell unitary. So this is going to be a unitary from H tensor L2 of gamma to itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this uh, so we can think of this as the direct sum overall uh, gamma of H. So that's how I'm going to think of this Hilbert space. So for each element of gamma, uh, we have this copy of H. And so I'm going to define this U to be preserving of all these copies. So specifically, we define this by U of C tensor delta T is exactly going to be pi t tensor uh, pi t applied to c tensor delta t. And what do we see here? So this is how I'm defining it on something tensor delta t. And then we extend it um, just linearly on the rest of the space. And you can check that this is indeed uh, preserves the inner product and hence extends uniquely to a unitary. Uh, so What's the point of all this is that if we now check, uh, let me make sure I remember which one. So if we check uh, one tensor lambda t, or I should use t, yeah, I'll, I'll use t, that's fine. U c tensor delta s. And let's go ahead and compute what this is, and you'll see what happens. So this is exactly one tensor lambda t, and now we have pi s c tensor delta s. And now we have that this is uh, pi s c tensor delta t s. Uh, but now I can apply u star to this. So if I put u star there, well, what is u star? u star is just replacing, instead of putting t here, you put the inverse there. So when we place put u star here, we're going to apply this by, uh, oh, I see, I must have done something wrong. So probably in my definition, I need an inverse here. And then that gets an inverse here inverse here. And now you star, you do it without the inverse. And so when we do it without the inverse, we get exactly uh, pi of t c tensor delta t s, uh, which is exactly pi tensor lambda t applied to c tensor delta all right, so what have I shown with this formula? I showed that u star 1 tensor lambda t u is equal on these, uh, equal to pi tensor lambda t. 
So, and this holds for all T and for all S, and hence taking linear combinations in S, you get that this holds for T. So you get that therefore, one tensor lambda is equivalent to pi tensor lambda. This U is the unitary which uh, moves one of these to the other. So what does that mean? So that means uh, I think I'm out of time to go through it. So maybe I'll finish up next time, which will also give me a chance to re-go over my notes. But the idea is that, uh, so now if we have any representation, what can we do? Uh, we can consider uh, what do I want. So we know that the left the trivial representation is weakly contained in the left regular representation. This is from amenability. I mean, I'll write out the proof, but uh, I'll be a bit more explicit next time because uh, this uses the Fell topology, which we haven't really done much. Uh, if the left regular representation contain, weakly contains the trivial representation, well, what does that mean? That that means in particular, uh, the trivial representation tensor pi, well, this is equivalent to pi, and this is weakly contained in the left regular representation tensor pi, which we saw over here is by Fell's absorption is equivalent to left regular representation tensor one. So a consequence of this, if you're familiar with the Fell topology, uh, is that every representation is weakly contained in the left regular representation. And another way of saying that is just exactly that this uh, map from the full group C star algebra of gamma to the reduced group C star algebra of gamma is an isomorphism, A star isomorphism. Now, we haven't done weak containment yet. We haven't talked about weak containment of representations yet. So on Monday, I'll maybe give you a rigorous uh, um, proof of this what, what I just said here real, real quickly. So we'll see, we'll see exactly why this is a star isomorphism. All right, any questions before I go? And we have a subfactor seminar in 12 minutes, which you are all welcome to attend. The link or the Zoom ID is on the subfactor seminar webpage if you haven't yet it, haven't gotten it yet. No password. We're going to see how it goes without a password. I do have a quick question. From sure. the first part of the proof, uh, for like the, if you have the, the star isomorphism, the very first thing said that uh, the reduced star algebra has a non trivial one dimensional star representation. But Why is that? Uh, yeah. That's because the full group C star algebra does. Mm -hmm. Mainly the universal property, you take the trivial representation and by the universal property of the full group C-star algebra, there is a representation which extends. The trivial representation of the group extends to the full group. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an isomorphism. Yeah, that's... that's and true. if if we have an isomorphism, then these are the same. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, why phi was multiplicative at the end of the calculation? Uh, why is phi multiplicative here? This is a general fact, which maybe we'll prove. Yeah, we'll prove that as a lemma next time. Uh, that uh, so that I'm using this fact that if phi is a state and x a uh, state on a C star algebra A and x is an A such that phi of x, x star is equal to phi of x star x is equal to the absolute value of phi squared, of phi of x squared. So then phi of x t is equal to phi of x times phi of t for all t in it. And also phi of Equal to phi, phi, phi of x. So this is, let's call it a lemma, and I'll prove this lemma on Monday. No? Thank you.